Welcome to Sivako, The Road to Avatar. My name is Sean Alexander and I'll be your guide through the world of Avatar and beyond. And today I have a special guest with me. A uh, special guest, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, so I'm, I'm Danny De Placido. I'm a contributor for Forbes. I write about TV, film, pop culture, celebrity gossip, stuff like that. Here to talk about Avatar. The reason I got you on was specifically about one of your articles. Um, uh, we'll get into it in a little bit, but before that, I do have a couple Avatar questions for you, as I do all my guests. Uh, the first of which is, do you remember when you first saw Avatar? Yeah, I mean, it was a long time ago, wasn't it? But I do remember vividly the experience of, of watching it in the cinema and definitely being blown away. And uh, I feel like there's not a lot of movies not a lot of blockbusters that kind of have that feeling of being transported to another world. Although Dune, I actually thought Dune, Dune was managed to accomplish that. Yeah, it's, it's like a rare breed of blockbusters where it does feel so otherworldly. Yeah, it's a difficult thing to pull off. Like, it really is. But no, uh, Dune managed it. But Avatar definitely at the time just totally blew me away. I remember seeing it in the theatres like multiple, multiple times. Um. And then the pop culture kind of conversation around it seemed to shift quite quickly. Yeah, that's that's something that seems to always be brought up as the the lack of pop culture around Avatar, um, which I think that's something that's going to change o- over the next few years, I can only imagine. We'll see, won't we? We'll see with the sequels. But I, I suppose there's truth to that, to that point that, that it didn't leave much of a footprint, although everybody knows about it. Like everyone seems to have an opinion on it. But you don't really see collectibles, merch, people talking about it, I guess. Yeah, that, that well, there's definitely a fan base for it. That's that's something I've been discovering as, as I've been going along. The uh, the fan base of Avatar is very passionate, and uh, they they they're desperate for new merch. Honestly, <laughs> so uh, another question for you is: Is there like a particular moment from the first movie that sort of stands out to you? Uh, well, the last I rewatched it fairly recently and favorite yeah the scene I, I like the scene where they they take down the tree the big massive sacred tree really stood up to me as a good moment as a very powerful moment when jake sully kind of he's forced to confront what he's actually done here and lied to these people and kind of set off these events in motion although i mean to be fair he didn't have much choice but it's an interesting moment for him as he's in like one foot in this world and one foot in the other and he's kind of forced to watch you know what he's really done yeah because before that point he's sort of having to toe that line between trying to be uh you know he's doing his job but also he is sort of falling in love with this new culture uh and yeah the destruction of home tree is sort of that first moment where he sees sort of the consequences of of not picking a side in a way he's (laughs) <laughs> and it, it sort of shows that uh, that sort of thing of like, if you don't pick the side of the oppressed, it's sort of choosing the side of the uh, the oppressor. Right. Yeah. You could see it as a metaphor for centrism or something. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. A little bit of that, I think. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I, this is the thing, I, I have, I overread everything in Avatar. So I feel like I'm <laughs> overanalyzing the entire film from start to end at this point. It's more fun to read movies that way, I think. A bit of overanalysis. Analysis. There's nothing wrong with that. Look, I did, I did a whole film degree. I, I That's all I had to do was overanalyze every single movie. And um, my, my last question on is, uh, what's, uh, what's your excitement level for The Way of Water? So I'm actually really keen for it. Like, I kind of forgot about Avatar for a few years, as did a lot of people, I think. Um, it's been, I don't know how long it's been, a decade at least? 13 years. That's been 13, has it? My God. Mm. Anyway, yeah, so, but then, you know, and, and you hear the announcement of these, what is it, five sequels or something? Four at least? We've got four but, sequels coming out, supposedly. Yeah. yeah, so, and you're kind of thinking, well, James Cameron's confident, you know? I wonder I wonder how much demand there is or how much the how the public will receive these sequels. But then finally we saw the first trailer and it just it did look beautiful and it did kind of really catch my eye especially because we were in the cinema i was taking my kids to see the multiverse of madness and the you know the new doctor strange 
and they were quite they were keen about the avatar they were like hey what's that you know that looks new that looks interesting and i was like yeah it does i didn't multiverse of, of madness is okay but i was like you know i'm more keen to revisit the world of pandora and, and see what's going on here and you know that like you know james cameron his passion is obviously like water he seems to be obsessed with deep sea diving even the first movie, the aesthetic, it's just, it looks like an underwater coral reef most of the time. So I'm curious to see what he's, what he's cooked up. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think that his focus on water is definitely going to be such a big element of this one. And it's kind of cool to hear that, you know, the younger generation are sort of seeing this tr- teaser and being like, oh, you know what, that kind of uh, looks interesting. Have they, have they seen Avatar before? I introduced it to them recently, but I was skipping some scenes because they're still pretty young, and I actually yeah. kind of forgot how edgy it was. Actually, <laughs> yeah, some of it's not like quite family friendly as much as this is sort of like a family friendly film. I, I guess it's it's as family friendly as a Marvel movie is. I guess uh, a little, bit, you know, it's less so. I thought there was like more swearing, a little more kind of um, violence, um, but I guess it doesn't it doesn't really cross a line. But I think it's uh, a PG thirteen, is it not? yes i think so yeah yeah so still yeah which makes its massive box office like success even more impressive right because normally it's like a kind of more watered down like spider-man movie that would make those kind of numbers now but no even with all the roughness it still it still managed to do very well but anyway the yeah the the parts i showed my kids they were pretty into it's definitely like still holds up i mean it looks gorgeous it it doesn't really feel like CGI has progressed that much beyond that first movie, which surprises me. Yeah, that's kind of a crazy thing to think. Is yeah, like I'm obviously revisiting Avatar a little, a little bit <laughs> recently, and yeah, like it's still really holds up. Like anything in terms of the CGI, I I think is pretty much flawless. And well, certainly for its time. And then you sort of think, like watching the teaser, you're like, okay, they've <laughs> somehow improved it and made it look even more realistic in a way right yeah i mean there are a few moments where it kind of looks a little uncanny but i mean you know it was 13 years ago i think it's a hell of an accomplishment still yeah there's there's things we see nowadays that look (laughs) at the same level as avatar did 13 years ago or, or worse than that still right yeah i mean the state of the vfx industry of being what it is and and you know there's all these stories about disney and marvel kind of rushing things through making changing their mind at the last minute and not making it easy for vfx artists to create their best work but i guess if you look to something like dune you can still see some really like beautiful vfx work being done yeah like dune and uh blade runner 2049 seem to stand out to me as like great examples of how cgi still used very effectively and made to look on a big scale as well that's right yeah and even uh, and, and that movie um what was it alita alita the kind of one that was based off the anime uh the movie was okay but i thought the vfx i know james cameron was involved in that but i thought the vfx looked pretty spectacular yeah that's uh that was meant to be a james cameron directed one and he just sort of uh he ended up helping to write and produce it so uh he still had his hands <laughs> involved and i think you can tell in a way with the vfx you can, you can. He he really has a, a careful, very close attention to detail. He seems to be dedicating a lot of his life to actually making these Avatar sequels. So, I mean, there's got to be something special, right? Yeah, <laughs> you'd, you'd sure hope so. Because, it, yeah, it's going to be, by the time we get to, like, the last, like, the fifth Avatar film, it'll basically be a 20-year span of him working on, and that's only since Avatar, re- like, the first one released. He obviously worked on that for... 10 odd years <laughs> between titanic and that yeah yeah and and he's kind of kept the plot to himself which i think is is interesting like the trailer you know so many trailers now they, they give everything away and that trailer really didn't yeah you know what that's one thing i've really noticed is uh no one really knows what's what's happening with the new one which is kind of fun i've gone into way, i've gone into way too many movies feeling like i already know the full plot or like enough seeing enough of the big action sequences where I could be like, okay, I can put these in order and figure out where, where this movie's going. Yeah. hundred percent. They'll like show you like the end scene. 
Oh, it's done that. Oh, there's one of it, and it did it so. I can't remember which film it was, but it's. Pro- I think it must have been one of the Marvel ones. But it showed like a a final shot from right right at the end of the movie, and I was like, "Well, this is clearly like the final battle." <laughs> I remember them doing it in Venom. They literally showed, I think, the exact end scene. It was very strange. I didn't oh. notice until I watched the movie, and I was like, "Oh, well, that you can <laughs> keep the camera over there." Like. Yeah, I feel like they did that. <laughs> it's for the Venom sequel, I think it was. They showed like so much of that one. But I think it's because they didn't really have a lot <laughs> of else to show. I suppose so. I guess I guess the whole idea is to just pull people in. Yeah. But I imagine the memory of this of this first Avatar film is enough to kind of at least whet people's curiosity. Yeah, definitely. And you know, that sort sort of brings us nicely onto the article that you wrote and uh for, I'll have posted this on Twitter and it'll be in the, the show notes. Um, but your article was uh, titled Avatar The Way of Water Promises a Refreshing Escape from Nostalgia. And it's really interesting because obviously you've sort of just mentioned there, there, there is going to be a little bit of nostalgia for Avatar, but it's definitely not to the same level that we see for the likes of Marvel and Star Wars nowadays. You know, this that, it's on a whole different level for those two. Exactly. I mean, I guess it's been long enough that there is a bit of a nostalgia element to it now. But um, it definitely does get tiring to look at, at the slate of what's coming out and just knowing that it's all, a lot of it is just reheated stuff from back when like we were kids. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't necessarily want to watch this stuff my whole life. You know? Yeah. Like, did, did you feel like that with the Comic-Con announcement? Because I, I sort of felt it when they were sort of lining up all these films for the next like two phases. And I was thinking... Well, I'm looking through it. I was like, man, these are not getting me as excited as they did about 10 years ago. No, no, they're not. They're not. Well, especially when it comes to Marvel, they're kind of really, I mean, I guess it's an interesting opportunity for them because they're now focusing on the more obscure comic book characters. And I suppose they could be interesting as well. But I just realistically don't know much about a lot of them. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess we'll just see. But I also just, you know, it's, it's hard to get excited with with the marvel stuff that just keeps churning out and churning out and you're like okay i guess i'll catch i'll catch what people say is good like i was quite keen for the new thor movie because i really really liked ragnarok probably probably my favorite marvel movie and then I, the reviews were so bad i was just like eh, i'm just gonna wait till it goes to streaming yeah, that that seems to be the case with a lot of these. As people are waiting now to just be like, oh, I could I could wait like three four months and it'll be on Disney Plus and I'll just watch it then. Yeah, exactly. If I want to take the kids to cinema, I want it to be something special. Um, but yeah, I don't like when it comes to like nostalgia cinema. It's it's I mean it's been going on for so long, but it's like it's it's way too far. I mean like Jurassic Park, you know, great original movie few good sequels but i just didn't i didn't think it would still be churning on and churning on like at least make a new franchise like dinosaurs are cool love them but at least make you know a new franchise or story in, involving dinosaurs we don't necessarily have to keep retreading this old stuff like i'm really not a fan of them bringing back like the old cast and just having them recreate these little iconic moments because i've already seen them i'm just i'm just not impressed by the the regurgitation yeah, I think there was a a moment in the new Jurassic World and Jeff Goldblum has his shirt open and it's for no reason. It is just so people be like, oh, look, he, he opened his shirt like he did in the first one again. Yeah, it's just like, I remember that. And that's all it is. It's kind of like watching an episode of Family Guy and you're like, oh, I know that. I recognize this reference. Oh, that's that's such an interesting way to phrase it, to be like, oh, this, you know, cinema's kind of turned into a Family Guy episode of, <laughs> oh, here's a thing you remember. Remember that when this happened before? cuts to that thing and then it's like oh yeah yeah i mean i think ghostbusters the new ghostbusters i think took it further way further than i've ever seen it being taken that was quite a surreal experience actually to watch that yeah i it's because they bring back what well, we'll do a brief spoiler here <laughs> but harold ramus comes back and if people don't realize he's dead um but they brought him back anyway because nostalgia it was weird. And just the whole kind of way they were treating the the Ghostbusters, you know, the, the items that they use with this kind of uh, sacred relics and the whole kind of tone of it being this kind of Spielbergian, you know, cornfields and like, you know, sun-kissed fields and all that. And I'm like, I don't really 
was this even what Ghostbusters was? I just remember it being kind of like this, this fun comedy. It didn't. <laughs> I don't think it was that meaningful, you know? That's it. And that was okay. Yeah, that's it. You're allowed to just have a film be a film sometimes. It's kind of nice when it that happens. Like, the first Ghostbusters is basically just a comedy where they try to catch ghosts and they're really bad at it. Yeah, and it's a good movie. And there's nothing wrong, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And actually, to, I mean, to be fair, when I was a kid, I liked all these animated spinoffs that they made. I actually, thought, I thought they were pretty cool. But I just find it weird to kind of hold up this franchise as this like amazing sacred thing when I'm like, yeah, it's cool, you know, <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, because like in a, I feel like in another dimension, Ghostbusters didn't continue as a like a this weird action franchise that they've been trying to do lately, and it kept more like a comedy route. And I feel like it would have been so much more interesting. And I think that's the thing with um, the nostalgia cinema that we see a lot of lately. Is they're not doing new ideas with it. They're sticking with the formula, not challenging us. But then something recently, which came out like last week, uh, Prey did something different with the Predator franchise. And then look, everyone loves it. That's right. Well, they actually kind of took it back to its roots in a way. But it wasn't just a remember this. It was just like, hey, this is, you know, it's a new setting, new a new character. And she's undergoing kind of the same thing that Arnold Schwarzenegger did. But it's just as good. It, it didn't feel like a retread. It felt like a reimagining. There's a difference. Yeah, I think that's it. I think there is that sort of different way of doing it. And just too often they're just trying to do a retread and it doesn't work. Yeah, I think the worst the worst culprit for it is, is Star Wars right now, for sure. I mean, that's just really just bleeding out whatever whatever fondness or, nostal- or nostalgia people have for that franchise. They're very much just squeezing every last drop of it. Being like, remember this? <laughs> remember this character? Well, now you're going to know he has a whole like series. You're going to know his origin story. Yeah, that, that feels like it's because Andor's coming out in a couple weeks. Oh, you know what? You know what? And- Andor actually looks good. I- I- I'm going to change my tune on that. Because That's it. I think <laughs> it does look interesting. But also, it's just like, it could have been any character. It didn't have to be him. But they, they use him, and obviously Diego Luna's a great actor, love him. But they used him because he's already in another thing. So people were like, oh, this is a character I know, and I get to put in more characters I know. They did, they did. But that, I think that case is okay, because it, it's kind of a weird situation where they kind of told the origin story of the Death Star, which I, I never really needed to hear, but now it's the, that's kind of branched off and into its own thing with Andor. And when I watched the trailer, I was like, oh, you know what? This actually looks kind of new. This doesn't really seem to be just retread and all the iconography that Star Wars is known for. It it really does seem to be trying something different, even if they got there through origin stories. I'm curious to watch it. On the other hand, Obi-Wan Kenobi as a series (laughs) was designed purely as a, hey, look, these characters did things before the thing you've already seen. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So and now they're going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. And it's interesting because I don't know what your opinion is on The Last Jedi. Um, but for me, that's the one interesting thing they've really done lately with Star Wars since the Disney takeover. That's like the most interesting that it's been. As in like, they actually challenged you to try and look at Star Wars in a different way. In hindsight, it was. I was mixed on it at the time. I was kind of like, I still kind of think it's half a good movie and half a kind of boring movie. Like I like all the stuff with Ray. I like all the stuff with Kylo. When they start going the side plots, the casino and the the pilot, you know, what's his name? Poe Dameron. Yeah. I, I I don't care as much for that stuff, but overall you gotta appreciate what Ryan Johnson was doing. He was actually challenging what, what Star Wars was all about and being like, hey, you can't just kind of jump into a cockpit and save the day at the last minute without a plan. It's actually kind of stupid. And, you know, maybe Luke can save the day by not even fighting in the first place. And it's, it's kind of a cool idea. And then they went so, they got so scared by the fan backlash to that, that they really went the other way with that horrendous, what was it, Rise of Skywalker? Which was just incoherent. It was a very strange experience watching that in the cinema. It was just... <laughs> it really was. Like, I remember, I, I went to midnight screenings for all the Star Wars because I'm too much of a fanboy. Um but I went to him and Rise of Skywalker was the one I distinctly remember walking out of and being like, what have I just watched? Like, what was happening? Was why weird. Why did we have these decisions going on to, to make it this film? 
Yeah, it was like a mon. It was like a montage of these kind of barely related scenes just kind of smushed together, and these like little checkpoints. So they're like, "Oh, look, the Wookiee got a medal this time." <laughs> yeah, it's just such a odd selection of character choices as well, like who they decide to focus on and what stories they wanted to tell. Like the whole Ray Palpatine thing is bizarre to me. I don't know why they decided to go that route. Yeah, well, to be honest, I didn't I didn't really love the fact that her parents were nobodies because I was like, I understand that they want to go against the the importance of the bloodline because maybe that's not the best messaging, but I do kind of I like the idea of it being in the Skywalker family. But whatever, they did it, right? It was a very strange decision to do a 180 on that and be like, "Oh, we were just joking." <laughs> her lineage is important. I was like, "Okay, well, you've already you've already made the decision. You kind of just you got to go with it even if it, even if some people didn't like it. Yeah, it's like those improvisation games you have to do in like drama classes where someone would say one thing, someone would say the next thing. Are you meant to like continue it on, not backtrack <laughs> past it? And it, Rise of Skywalker just feels like it is backtracking, trying to ignore ev- anything interesting that like Ryan tried to bring to the franchise. Yeah, in response to like the whiniest fans as well. You don't have to listen to them. <laughs> And I, I think that's where Avatar's going to sort of succeed in that James Cameron doesn't really care what the fans think. He will make this movie how he wants to make it. That's the way it should be done, honestly. I don't think I don't think creators should listen to their fan bases. <laughs> they should just tell the shop and just deal with it. You either like it or you don't, right? Yeah, like, that's just how it should be, really, if I'm, on, if I'm honest. It's nice to hear, like, feedback and hear what people have to say and theories and interpretations and stuff like that and i'm sure he probably has read all sorts of interpretations of his work but he doesn't let that change what he makes in the future that's right like the nice thing about cameron is he definitely makes what he wants to make so whatever it be like even if the sequels are like a burning disaster i think they'll at least be interesting yeah that's it i'd rather see like an interesting disaster than just a bland I'm I'm thinking of like porridge, like bland porridge of a film. Yeah, exactly. I don't want there to be like a subcommittee of suggestions that eventually just water it down into nothing. Like, just take a risk. Yeah. See what happens. Definitely. And what I think is interesting is, uh, you mentioned it in your article, was that obviously Disney now sort of, they don't own Avatar, but they it's under their banner because of the Fox merger. But it seems like Avatar is still a sacred cow in that, James Cameron can't, <laughs> won't let them touch it. Yeah, I imagine, well, he seems to have a very forceful personality, so I imagine he just wouldn't really cooperate if, if they tried to make, you know, changes. But I don't I don't really think, yeah, I, I think this is his baby. He's been working on it for so long. I imagine no one like else understands the film to the extent that he does. I'm, I'm sure it is going to be his vision either way. Yeah, that, that's sort of I'm I'm looking forward to seeing it, regardless of how it come, you know, how it turns out. And obviously, I'm <laughs> doing a whole podcast about Avatar. I'm hyping it up, and I really hope it's not a disappointment because it will be an interesting couple of weeks afterwards if it is. Uh, well, I mean, even if it is, I mean, look what happened with like the Star Wars prequels when they were viewed as this huge disappointment, but they 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 just sparked so much conversation. There was so much discourse. You had the younger generation growing up on them, and and they like a lot of them love them for what they are because they just that was their first introduction to it, and it wasn't like there wasn't value to them. They did have a good storyline, even if I don't think the execution was great. Yeah, that's that's, that's such a good example. Like yeah. I, I'm, I was growing up in during the prequels era, and that's the ones that I sort of remember the most fondly in a way. Um, yeah, me too. I saw that. I saw them first before I saw the original trilogy. Oh, man, you had like the and best then... experience of it. They're like, no sort of like, oh, this is like your image of Star Wars in your head. You went prequels. This is the Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. No one told me that it was like, it was bad. <laughs> no, but I kind of, I felt like I'd already watched the original trilogy almost by osmosis. Just like the strip. There were so many references to Star Wars in everything all the time that I just felt like I was familiar with the story before I'd even seen those prequels. So hmm. it was kind of interesting. Yeah, definitely. So with The Way of Water coming out, obviously in December, what do you think is going to be, do you think it will have a change in how cinema <laughs> cinema, and obviously like this nostalgia cinema is going to change at all? Obviously there's a 13 year gap with, and Avatar is a sequel. 
but is it going to ch- you know and we've had top gun maverick this year which has actually changed how we look at these sort of legacy sequels a bit i think do you reckon there's going to be a change in that in the future and hopefully a little less of a dead and buried jurassic world types possibly i mean james cameron has a really good record when it comes to his his box office earnings i mean if it makes a lot of money maybe they'll be looking at it twice and being like well maybe original sci-fi can still thrive with that kind of budget hmm but I don't know. I think it's always just safer to go on a recognized IP and, and, and do your money and put your money into that. We'll have to see. To be we, we did have a few like tries after Avatar to try and continue the sort of uh, big sci-fi blockbusters and they sort of did fail along the way. I think John Carter is the obvious sort of example of that. Yeah, which I mean is very similar to Avatar, right? I'm sure James Cameron was inspired by that, but it felt... I don't know, John John Carter. I just I feel like I just don't really re- I watched it, but I just don't remember it. It didn't really leave an imprint on me. I know I've seen it. I can't remember a single detail of it, unfortunately. Yeah. I guess it was just a bad movie or just a mediocre one. But I think it was just very middling. People, yeah. I mean people say that about Avatar that it didn't leave a footprint, but I, I can remember it definitely. And to be honest, watching it again, it was a pleasant surprise, just that it was about something. It had something to say. I think the message was a lot thoughtful than than your average Marvel movie, which is so pro-military. It's so like, you know, never change the status quo. People who want to change the status quo are villains. I, I know that's integral to all kind of superhero stories, but Avatar is very much like, you know, the military industrial complex is a terrible thing. Like humans are doing, you know, look at what we've done. I like how it doesn't actually show the ruined earth but it just implies that it's completely a wreck and that we've had to go and colonize another planet in our greed and you know that's a good message it's it's better than whatever marvel is saying now yeah uh, you know what's really interesting you mentioned about like earth in in within avatar and there's like an extended edition which has like a bonus scene at the front which is jake sully on earth and people are wearing like masks because like pollution is so bad that no one can breathe <laughs> and it was sort of like when you sort of look at that comparatively like obviously we've had all of covid and everything and obviously people have to wear masks because of that you sort of see like these comparisons be like oh james cameron's a bit ahead of the game again uh <laughs> sort of predicting how society's going and looking at how yeah like our sort of love of the military through these like sort of marvel films yeah you kind of believe what they have to say and in the film jake believes he's going to get his legs back because of the military um but he sort of figures out in the end that yeah no he'll get just disposed of once they get what they want yeah he's just a piece of meat to them i think he's he's called that at one point but no actually i haven't seen that extended scene but i like the fact that they just didn't show earth just the kind of the mention of it was enough. We just kind of got the impression it was this dead husk. Maybe it was best left to the imagination. And it was all about Pandora. Recently, it feels like we don't really get sci-fi that's utopian or it's not looking towards a brighter future because I don't think I don't think many people feel optimistic about the future anymore. And it's all dystopia. Mm. When some sci-fi is about the fantasy of living in, with this future technology. And then it became about you know the fantasy of living in a ruined world but but avatar is about the fantasy of just returning to nature going to live with indigenous people and just kind of living with the forest and you know it's it, it, it's quite interesting it's, it's a big contrast yeah because you think like when people think of sci-fi films like the biggest ones set in the future are the ones like your total recall or your blade runners and yeah they're like dystopian worlds basically where people are just holding on for dear life and Avatar sort of offers you something different. It's that sort of hope of moving back to a more nature-based way of living, having a better connection with each other and, and the world. Yeah, and it's definitely like a, a you know a rose-coloured glasses view of nature. I mean, I, the, I, from my understanding, the tribe is shown to be pretty flawless. They don't have... They don't seem to have problems. But, you know, it's... I do like the fact that the humans are seen as the invading alien species. Yeah, that that's an interesting way to fr- frame it because I don't think it often happens like that, really. And there's not many that I can think of in that way. Um, 
what I thought was interesting was that it came out the same year as District 9, um, which is, again, there's sort of like a sort of a fun little double bill there for, for people in terms of like uh, yeah. human alien interaction. Yeah, it was. It was a good year for science fiction. Uh, both of those the aliens were kind of the oppressed class in, in, in those stories. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. I, I don't feel like we've had much since then that kind of show that either. Um, we haven't. I don't know why, because now it's all... Uh, I guess we keep going back to Marvel, but those are the same kind of big budget movies that are out now, but it's the aliens are always just an invasive force. And they don't really have much. They're just kind of, you know, purple or they like... Or they're just people that are like bluish tinge or something. I don't know, but they're just not interesting. There's no metaphor. I guess the metaphor is that they're an invading other, but that's that's not that's kind of empty. Right? Yeah, definitely. And I feel like the the one movie that people try to say is try to say something is, is Captain Marvel, which is basically the most milita- pro military of the Marvel movies there is. Uh, and, but it, it but people will be like, oh, but it has a whole thing about like how they're you know they're. She's been lied to by her government, and that she's been going after. She is part of the oppressors, and she learns to help the oppressed instead. And but then it's just it, this Captain Marvel is so pro military, like it's <laughs> it is an advertisement. Yeah, from, it kind of contradicts yeah, itself. Yeah, like it's crazy, and I think that is the problem with these Marvel movies: is that they're they're held back by the fact that they have to be Marvel movies, and there's like a laundry list of things they have to include to get get back in basically right and I, I mean to be fair to marvel movies i don't think they're actually trying to say anything oh no 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 i think we're giving them way too much credit for uh trying yeah. to have any sort of change in society this marvel movies are for entertainment purposes only yeah but you know i mean even even a big budget blockbuster that's kind of a little empty it should have something to say right yeah look like maybe you can say you could argue that Avatar isn't that deep, but it's deep enough to talk about. Yeah, like that. I I always think of Mad Max Fury Road. That's a perfect example of like a blockbuster which has something to say, and it it shows that you can do it. You you just have to be bold enough to want to make a statement. It's not a lot to ask, I think. Yeah, I think that's it. You just if it, it'd be great just to see more of that and Marvel take a few more risks, but they won't because. Uh, they are the status quo now. Uh, it's sort of interesting because obviously before all the MCU kind of had that popularity, superheroes and being fans of comics were seen as being like part of the outside group. And now it's like, no, you guys are the, the mainstream. You you set the president now. You And everyone else is trying to be, were... the, be the indie darling. They were though. They were outsiders for a long time. But yeah, it's true. And then they, they, they sort of just kind of got pulled into the mainstream i guess starting with spider-man really but but yeah marvel really set the template there um but i mean i think you can tell some very interesting stories using superheroes we've seen it with uh, the boys and um watchmen mm. and uh what was it i don't know if you saw An- amazon's invincible but there's definitely a way to tell stories about power and kind of to critique the superhero genre I think The Boys is a perfect example of that, um, trying to critique what superheroes mean and the sort of power structure it sort of implies. Yeah, no, it is. And it's 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 good because it's a show that kind of knows what it is. It's almost like, it almost has the same tone as South Park and it, it just loves to be crude and kind of dumb. But, you know, it has more to say than, than any of the Marvel movies, really. <laughs> and again, I think that's it. We're just looking for something to be said a lot of the time. Um, you you said Watchmen and the Watchmen series, I think, is a fantastic example. It was really good. It deviated from the comic quite a lot, and I, I really love the comic. But um, it, it at least did its own thing. I got to say, it wasn't it wasn't a reheated nostalgia thing. It, it was it was definitely telling a new story within that universe, and I, I yeah. had to admire that. Is there like any other blockbusters for you since since Avatar that have really stood out to you um, as as things that people might want to? Well, they've probably already seen them, but maybe if if they're still looking for some blockbusters with a bit of uh, bit of spice behind them. It's going back a few years now, but I thought Annihilation was amazing. Like a really, really good, interesting, thoughtful piece of sci-fi. I was really sad it bombed. Oh, we we only got it over on Netflix over here, so we didn't even get a cinema release. No, it, it just went straight to Netflix. Um, 
But that's not a bad thing for me. I got to watch it a couple of times early on, so that was nice. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. At least people watch it if it goes straight to Netflix. You don't necessarily want to spend your money if it... Well, I guess that's why they kind of rely on these recognized brands because it's it's kind of hard. You know, you've you've got so so much access to so many, so much different types of media that it's you're kind of reluctant to maybe spend the money on a cinema ticket if you don't know that you're going to like it. So I do get why people kind of stick to the stuff they know. Yeah, because then they're like, oh well, you know, even if it sucks, I'm seeing it be something familiar being reskinned, and there's something there's value to that. Yeah, that's it. We, you know, I think if I remember off the top of my head, this year's sort of like best performing films. I think, you know, I think Elvis is probably like the highest performing one, which isn't like a IP, and even that's just a biopic. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't watch it, but then people have been sharing clips on Twitter, and it actually looks pretty oh, fun. It is. It's absolutely it's wild. Man. Like it's <laughs> just again, it's one of these things where it's like at least. Uh, Baz Luhrmann, you know he's going to try something with it, and he really goes for it. He doesn't... He knows that Walk Hard exists, clearly, and he knows that people know what to expect from a biopic, and he just leans into it, because why not? It's part of the fun. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Baz, he's got a hell of a personality. You can just see it. Like, I think you just have to watch, like, a scene of his out of context, and you kind of know that it's his. He... It's, it's a style that's as, dis- as distinct as Tarantino's or something. It's, it's just, You know immediately, so... I might watch that. I, you know what? That's an interesting point. Is a sort of like that director brand as well. Uh, that's something that I feel like has almost started to draw people in a bit more because obviously Jordan Peele's now almost <laughs> as recognised YP, which is a bit crazy. Like, who would have thought that <laughs> a few years back? But he, he would. He himself is the IP. Yeah, I forgot to talk about Nope. You're talking about big blockbusters that are good. Nope was amazing. I really loved it. Jordan Peele definitely his name alone will attract me to the cinema because I know he's gonna he's gonna take these very familiar genre tropes and he's he usually puts a very distinctive spin on it and he definitely did with no awesome <laughs> you'll like it for oh, sure I, I can't wait I've been looking forward to it for a long time okay, so out of curiosity what was your take on the whole um avatar didn't leave uh, a footprint on our culture I think it's I think it's a harsh criticism when you consider like what people compare it to. So when people bring up that sort of argument, they're comparing it to your Star Wars. But guess what? Star Wars had a you know a sequel within a few years. It also had a lot more marketing and merchandising than Avatar did. Um, you know, the mer- the merchandising for Star Wars is literally the invention of modern merchandising, the way we see it. It was, yeah, it changed it changed everything. Yeah, like, Ava- no, that's all right. <laughs> and yeah, just with Avatar, I feel like this is, in a way, I'm looking at it as though the, the Avatar we've had already, that is almost a prequel for what these four are about to do, which are the the story. You know, Avatar was a setup explaining who the main players are, what the world is. You've now had that established. You could go to the Way of Water now, and it's bang straight into the story, because you know who these people are. And this could be, yeah, this could be a start of what Star Wars is able to accomplish. That's true. When you look back, it's the reactions I think people had to watching Avatar and Star Wars sounded kind of similar to me. I wasn't really around when the first Star Wars came out, but people watching it in the cinema multiple times, becoming hyper fixated on it. I, I do remember people doing that at the time of Avatar coming out, and there were these weird stories about how like people kind of were falling into depression because they wanted to live in Pandora. Um, I don't know how much truth there was to those. But I do think the film reminded us of that we just don't have a connection with nature. And, you know, maybe it was presenting this kind of fantasy vision of, a, a you know, this magical tribe that can literally plug themselves into trees and stuff. But, you know, I, I think it made people feel kind of sad, but maybe not in the same way that they were obsessed with Star Wars. And rewatching it again, it was, I think, I think what Avatar, I suppose, failed to do was kind of create these iconic thing. Like, I don't know, what, what would you say? Like, I think Star Wars is just very good at just creating iconic moments or just things like the, the lightsabers, the sound of them and the feel of them and the look. You, a kid sees that and they want to play with a lightsaber or a kid sees a Wookiee and they're kind of, 
it's very distinctive looking and you can draw it and you can remember it. But I get the feeling that when I watch Avatar, the monsters and the creatures are really cool, but I feel like I don't really remember what they look like when the movie's over. No, I think, I think that's a fair point because it's a lot of <laughs> like limbs on creatures and... Yeah, they're quite odd. Like if I saw a toy of one of the, you know, the horses or the dragons, I kind of, I, I, I wouldn't instantly recognize it as Avatar necessarily. And and the weapons they use, they're not distinctive. They're mostly kind of the, the tribal things. I, I don't really have a, a, a thing that I associate with Avatar really apart from the plant, I guess, apart from the blue skinned aliens, the Navi. Mm. So I would, I would be curious to see if the sequel manages to create that kind of iconography. Yeah, that's something I think is going to be like the biggest challenge in a way because creating iconography is it, it, a tough challenge in itself. You know, Star Wars obviously has done it. But a lot of the time, it's. I, I think Avatar struggles in that sense because it does play on a lot of tropes. You know, all the characters in this are, an, are basically just an archetype. There's not. <laughs> yeah, same with Star Wars, though. Same with Star Wars. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's it. And I think maybe because. You know, obviously, there's a big gap between the original Star Wars coming out and Avatar, but we've got to the point where these archetypes are so familiar with us that we, you know, that that they don't become recognizable characters unless they have something very unique about them. And obviously, Avatar maybe doesn't have the most unique characters in a way, but maybe that's going to change. We'll see. Who, who knows? These sequels seem to be trying some new stuff. Uh, a few characters coming back who were dead. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, everyone came back, didn't they? Yeah, he's he's back as an avatar, and uh, Sigourney Weaver's back as a child avatar. So that'll be interesting. I see why they brought that guy back. Actually, he's a very good villain. He just plays he plays that character just perfectly. You've perfectly. seen him in Don't Breathe, then, haven't you? I haven't actually. No. <gasps> oh, <laughs> okay. You're in for a ride if you watch Don't Breathe. <laughs> It's really interesting, I think, to sort of look at how the sort of blockbuster landscape has changed since the first Avatar. It We've had literally the entire MCU. <laughs> like, that, it wasn't a thing at the start. It was just Iron Man and the Hulk. And now we are so deep into the MCU that, you know, those characters seem so far gone. Well, obviously, well, Iron Man's not around anymore, but Hulk is just a side character and... We're on to <laughs> having pl- people like Moon Knight and uh, Miss Marvel as sort of the leads. And I think it's shown sort of like how the blockbuster landscape has changed in that time. It definitely has. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I guess the genius of Marvel was always like, oh, there's more to come. You're, you're going to keep seeing these characters interact with each other. And that's all. This kind of trail of breadcrumbs can be enough to have people coming back for more. But I wonder how long they can keep that momentum. Like, like I said, I didn't watch it, but the, the reaction to Thor Love and Thunder just didn't seem to be that enthusiastic. And I don't know, when it comes to something like um, The Eternals, I think Marvel was betting big on The Eternals. And I, I thought it was interesting, but like it wasn't, I, it, it, it didn't feel as strong as, as their other stuff. Like I, you didn't necessarily want to see these Eternals characters again, maybe one or two actually. But I know they were betting big on that, and now, yeah, they have these more obscure figures. Unless they can make them as popular as Iron Man, I'm, I'm not sure if, if they're going to eventually run out of steam. People might just get fatigued. I I think it's starting to kick in a little bit. I think, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's because of the teaser, but I feel like a lot of people maybe went and watched the teaser for Avatar, saw Doctor Strange afterwards, and then most people might have been talking about the Avatar teaser afterwards. Quite possibly, yeah, yeah. Because for me, Doctor Strange wasn't nearly as impactful as I thought it was going to be. Um, and I don't know if that's because we've had the likes of the the Avenger level ones recently and Spider-Man No Way Home as well, where they were more impactful and there was more going on and Doctor Strange almost felt small scale again. Yeah, they really don't know what to do with this multiverse that they've introduced. Like, they just haven't done anything interesting with it. And there's multiverses everywhere now. You know, and kind of, I think Rick and Morty set the template for how to do multiverse very well. And I just don't see Marvel just doing anything particularly. Like, it seemed like they were going to do something very interesting in Loki, but we haven't seen much of that. That whole, um, 
well, that villain that they introduced we haven't seen again, but also just the, the whole idea of, of, like, there was a powerful moment of in Loki when, like, you could see the Infinity Stones and they had, like, millions of them and they were using them as paperweights and stuff. And I, th- I thought that was good. It was showing the power scaling. Oh, you thought that threat was big? Well, you know, it's nothing in comparison to the multiverse. But then when we saw the multiverse in Doctor Strange, they were just kind of hopping through a few different realities that didn't weren't really that distinctive and then they just that was it it was over i feel like they haven't really messed with this whole alternative versions of different heroes meeting each other and stuff i think it could be quite fun that's it i think there's so much uh potential with that and they really just haven't done anything too exciting yet with it and i think as well because we've had everything everywhere all at once come out this year and show you how to do a multiverse movie suddenly everyone's like oh what we should see yeah, no, no, they they really they, they did a, a spectacular job with that. They really did. Like, so it's kind of hard to it's hard to follow stuff like that when other people are when there are other creatives out there who don't necessarily have the same restrictions as Marvels as Marvel, and they're using the same the concept of the multiverse. They can definitely take it a lot further. So, I think I think Marvel could make it interesting, though. As I say, having diff- alternative versions of heroes come in to fight each other, have conflicts with each other. The whole what if, the animated what if series I thought was actually quite interesting. If they could, if they could push that into live action. I'll agree with that. I thought what if was, I thought what if was really interesting. I think the Doctor Strange episode was a better version of Doctor Strange than we've actually had in the MCU. Yeah, that's part of the reason why I think it felt like a letdown to me. I was like, oh, the animation was better. Weird. Yeah, <laughs> because there's like a whole relationship with Christine. They sort of explore in that episode. And it's so much better fleshed out than it ever was in these two movies we've now had with Doctor Strange in the MCU. Yeah, and talking about better like animated version, it's um. The, the, did you see the Star Wars? What is it? Visions. Uh I've watched a few of them. They and they've been really good. I thought they were great. I thought that was exactly what Star Wars should be doing. Because you, all you, all you need is that universe where you have these kind of. You know, fantastical over the top showdowns between these two samurai gunslinger figures and just let them go for it and just kind of explore, like just show us new stuff. We don't have to keep returning to the, the same old characters that we know. It's so nice to see them you do it in different styles as well. Like that it's the kind of inventiveness that you'd hope to see. Yeah, it was great. It was like play in the sandbox. Don't don't bring back Luke, this horrible CGI puppet. That, like... <laughs> well, that's that's I think the bit that's almost turned me off of Star Wars. Unfortunately, as, as you know, I, I'm I'm still watching it, but that the Luke moments have really ruined what I was hoping these <laughs> TV series were going to be, because it is just reanimating a, a, a dead horse. It was, it, yeah, I thought it was kind of horrible, and I, I thought the way he was speaking was so flat. And then I, I read later that it was like an AI. <laughs> doing his voice or at least enhancing it that that's not right like it just didn't and then weirdly enough the fan base didn't seem upset by that they seemed happy that they were like oh look he's back but they were so like I, I, you know i i understood the complaints that, that when luke was the the bitter old hermit in the last jedi I, d- I did kind of see how people found it jarring but it was so much worse to see him come back and be this dead-eyed <laughs> puppet <laughs> And that's it. We've seen people do interesting things with bringing back characters. I think, you know, Bla- I'll go back to Blade Runner 2049. They brought back characters in an interesting way in that, and even in CGI as well. So it is possible to do it, but that clearly just CGI and an AI-generated voice and just nothing behind the eyes is not the way to go. Yeah, and I wonder if they're going to keep doing it now that they're kind of perfecting the technology, but I also don't think there's much for these characters to do when they come back like that, apart from just kind of stand around and say things in a really flat way. (laughs) Or or do um, some, uh, they'll do some some fights, but it'll be like completely from behind. So you don't see that who's actually doing the fighting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like fights with no, with no uh, face zooms in, right? Like with no real sense of who is what or or where they're standing. Uh, so I was going to ask, have you got any final thoughts on uh, Avatar and The Way of Water? Yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to say, right, because it's just there's so little info about it. But um, I do know it's going to shift focus to the children, which is quite interesting. And I kind of wonder if it's going to be a bit more family friendly, because that is probably the way to break the 
to break the box office now. You, you kind of do want something that you can take your young kids to see. Um, so maybe there'll be a bit of shift in tone. But I think otherwise, I, I'm quite, I'm, I'm pretty keen to see it because I know that they've mapped out this whole planet and there's all these different biomes and there's all this, this, there's clearly a lot of stuff that we haven't seen. So I do look forward to the feeling of just going in and having that escapism of kind of being on another world. And it, yeah, this, um, now that they've done, as you say, all the setup and the simplicity of that first story, then technically James Cameron can run root and run loose. Yeah, that's it. You can kind of challenge these archetypes now more than you ever could in, in one movie. You can. You've got all the exposition out of the way. He's done it. So it's just... I, I wonder if they're going to actually re-release the first movie in cinemas just to get people re You'll be excited to hear they are. They're releasing it 23rd of September. All <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, there we go. That, that's, that's <laughs> oh, we might even see Avatar hit the 3 billion point before the, the new one comes out. You know what? It also kind of reminds me of the whole 3D thing, which no one ever did very well apart from Avatar. It was like the first 3D movie and then no one else managed to replicate 3D effects, I think, to my knowledge, to the same degree. I'm going to have to do an episode on 3D movies that came after Avatar because I think it's such an interesting topic because what happened, honestly, at some point, people just stopped making them. They just decided like, no, no more, not going to bother. So I, I'm going to have to try to find out when it well, was. I, I hated them, eh? <laughs> I, I loved it in Avatar, but then I saw a few afterwards and I just started to genuinely resent the technology because it had clearly been sloppily done because not everyone's as meticulous as James Cameron. So it was like the sloppy effect that had been added after. And I saw, I think it was when I was watching one of the new Pixar movies, it just seemed like the colors were so diminished. And if you weren't sitting exactly in the right spot in the cinema, you, you would have this kind of cross-eyed effect where things just don't look right. And I was like, this is just garbage. And you're paying extra for these annoying gar- glasses and no one else did it apart from this one movie. So I guess maybe 3D will make a comeback. Hey, we'll see. Some- maybe maybe 3D, <laughs> 3D is going to make a re- re- return. We'll see. Um, yeah, yeah th- uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Um, where would be the best place for people to find you? Oh, so, I mean, I'm on Twitter, but also, yeah, going to my homepage on Forbes. That's where you can find most of my the articles I write. And, uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Come on. It was a lot of fun talking about this movie. Of course. And uh, if, you know, post Way of Water, you've got some deep thoughts you want to share on, on the film, always got a platform here. Yeah, yeah. If you want to find me, you can find me at Avatar Pod. And we're on the usual podcast streamers as well as YouTube and TikTok now, which is fun. Uh, and um yeah thank you everyone for listening i hope you have a lovely day goodbye